Um, welcome everyone to today's NFT fundamental session with me, William, and alongside, alongside me, I have Sume, a fellow analyst from Twinbit. Uh, we have been working since the start of the year on a few NFT reports, uh, writing articles about NFTs and just exploring the space. And we're building a community of learners, of executives like you guys that want to learn about NFTs and um, just get into NFTs, not for you know the investing side of things, but more of understanding what it can be used for, how it can be used in business and um, understanding the technology behind it. And so today we have our very first session, immersion session, where it's kind of, you know, like an experiment, like um, a three-part program where we do programs on different topics. So an immersion consists of, you know, two to three sessions that are going to be split into three parts. Um, webinars, discussions with um, our experts, as well as case studies, which you guys can use to apply some of the knowledge. Um, the whole idea of an immersion is to um, compact all these learning into two to three week programs so that you guys don't have to commit so, you know, commit throughout like a six months course, you know. Um, learning can be, you know, quite extensive, but we want things to be short and sweet so that you guys can get up to speed really quickly. Um, yeah, the three pillars learn with us or with experts. Um, we also want you guys to engage with us whenever possible. So we encourage all questions, all thoughts, because we don't want this session to be just us sharing our stuff, but we also want you guys to share what you, what you think. Any thoughts you may as well now? No, I think we can start with our topic today. Okay, um, what's in store for today? So these topics are kind of um, decided on the basis of, we assume you guys read our report. Uh, you know, the first NFT report that we released. Um, so it's going to be a lot of fundamental things, um, a little bit of a walkthrough about what we've learned and what we've uh, uncovered from our studies. Um, we try to help you get a, a better picture of um, what NFTs are, but not only that, we want to get, um, get to help you paint a, a clearer view of what the larger NFT market looks like. Because um, it's not about um, what NFTs are, but you know what they can be used for, um, what's the opportunity, there, why are companies getting into the space? You know, we're just trying to help you paint the global or sort of more overall um, picture of the whole space. Um, we won't get into you know investing in NFTs or any projects related to all these NFTs because we think that those are for you know the Moon Boys and those. YouTube creators, uh, all those channels that you, you can search for on your, on your own. So we want to take a bit of a different approach and try to look at NFTs from a more enterprise sort of view. So what we'll cover today, what are NFTs, um, how do NFTs work, um, a little bit more technical details, um, global market developments in terms of how the market looks like and some of our thoughts on what drives the market, what's stopping global adoption and all those stuff. So yeah, um, let's get right into it, I guess. If you guys have any questions, just raise your hand and we can unmute you or you can just type it in the chat box. Okay, if there's nothing else, then let's learn about NFTs. Well, in order to really understand NFTs, right, um, what I would normally tell my parents or my grandparents is um, you have to know what the word fungible means because NFT means non-fungible tokens, right? Um, fungibility in, a, in its most basic definition is how you can exchange an asset um, with another of the same type. So for example, um, money, right? If you 
if your friend gives you a ten dollar bill um, because you want to borrow it to you know buy lunch or anything, you hand them back uh, another ten dollar bill. It it won't make a big difference, right? You won't get mad over it because money is fungible. Um, oil is fungible. Gold is fungible. You know, one kilogram of gold is the same as another kilogram of gold. That's what fungible means. So if you look on the chart, right, on the top left, we've, we've kind of divided assets into tangible, intangible, um, fungible, and non-fungible. So fungible, you can think of all the real world items like money, or gold. Um, intangible stuff are like cryptocurrencies, digital currencies. So if I have a Bitcoin and let's say I want to exchange um, one Bitcoin for your one Bitcoin, right? It won't make a difference which Bitcoin I have because they all have the same value. Non-fungible is kind of different because each item or each asset is unique on, it, on its own. So if you look at the bottom left of the chart, um, you have houses, you have paintings, you have used cars. Those are non-fungible because if you trade it with the different car, it's not the same because your car, you know, I drive a Honda City. Um, if I trade it with someone else's Honda City, it's, it's not the same because I've driven it, you know, different mileages. I've installed different accessories on it. It won't be the same as someone else's. So when it comes to intangible stuff, we can think of copyrights because copyrights are, you know, they're intangible because they give owners like unique or exclusive rights to a certain, you know, artwork or creative work. You know, that's, that's non-fungible because you can't have the same copyright on the same items. That's, that's the whole um, idea of what fungible is. Now, why would fungibility be important, right? Um, I, I'd like to give an example of the Mona Lisa. Um, the, the one that sits in the Louvre Museum that is painted by Leonardo da Vinci. Um, it's important because many people go and watch the, or see the original. Um, you can buy a poster of a Mona Lisa and hang it up on your room wall and you can see the same thing, right? You, you see the Mona Lisa as, as it is. There's no difference. Maybe the poster has even better definition, you know, in terms of picture quality, in terms of color. But why is the original one worth close to a billion dollars and your, re, your you know, poster has a resale value of, you know, maybe 10 ringgit? It, it, there's a big difference there. The, the idea I want to you know, push forward to you guys is that originality matters, right? Just like how um, you know sneaker collectors that collects you know, genuine sneakers instead of just buying some ripoff from you know supermarkets and morning markets, those kind of things. So originality matters in the real world, but I don't think originality can happen when it comes to the digital world because anything you see on the digital world is sort of information and information can be copied. You know, it's easily copied because it's just made up of zeros and ones. So is this, why would you want to have an NFT, right? Um, why would you want to distinguish something as unique on the internet or in the digital world? It's the same reason why um, you want to own sort of the original Mona Lisa instead of like a poster. Sometimes it may be sentiment, sometimes it may be an investment, you know. NFTs just give you a unique way of owning things on the internet. And so what are NFTs, right? Um, after explaining the concepts of fungibility and originality, um, this is where NFT sort of ties the two concepts together. Um, in essence, they're just basically tokens. Tokens as in a record on the blockchain. Well, I hope you guys understand what blockchain is because um, it's fundamental to the whole NFT hype. Um, they're just tokens that 
is stored on the blockchain and owners of these tokens, um, they, is, they essentially own a representation of what the token is. So for example, I can turn my phone into a token and the owner of that token means the owner of the phone. But all this, of course, is in the context of the digital world. Now, NFTs being built on the blockchain, they are recorded on the blockchain. So every transaction that ever involves NFTs, for example, the transfer, sale, creation, you know, everything is visible and transparent on the blockchain itself. So anyone and everyone can look at what NFT you bought, what NFT you sold, and et cetera, right? Um, they also quite secured because of transparency of the blockchain and no one can kind of modify or take away your ownership of that, that one token. Think of it as, um, so, so relating, relating back to you know, the fungibility concept, right? Think of, um, if you have a dog, think of your pet dog. Um, your dog can look like any other dog if of the same breed, right? But how do you um, differentiate your dog with another dog? You have a collar for them that writes your name or your pet's name. The collar is kind of like the NFT. I don't know if that analogy makes sense, but um, that's sort of my way of how to differentiate um, things using an NFT. So NFTs and crypto, they're not really the same thing, although people may you know, try to mix those two concepts up because as you know from the fungibility concept, cryptos are fungible while NFTs are not. So when people try to confuse you with those two concepts, then you kind of know what it is. Um, another good example is to think of NFTs as trading cards, you know, sort of um, these Pokemon cards that some of you may collect during your younger days. Um, the features of each NFTs, right, is different from the other. Um, you know, comparing a common card, which has, you know, maybe one or two skills with a rare card with, um, which might have, you know, better health points, better damage points. Those are kind of the differentiating factors with from one NFT to the other. And with these, you know, special attributes, each card have different value. So it's the same with NFTs. And you wouldn't trade like a common, you know, card for an ultra rare card, right? Because intrinsically, you know that you're, you're losing value because the ultra rare one is obviously going to be more scarce than the common. And that's why you see a lot of people paying insane monies um, for these like super high-end projects, NFT projects. So think of NFTs as sort of digital represent, representation of these cards and they're all stored on the blockchain. And you can do anything and everything with these NFTs. You can trade them like how you would trade these trading cards. You can sell them, you can burn them, you can send them to your friends whatever you can think of. Um, with that said, right? NFTs can exist in any different format because NFTs are just basically what you take from the digital world and putting it on the blockchain. So NFTs can be photos, can be art, can be you know, digital art that people draw on, I don't know, AI or, or um, paint. Even right, if you look at the the picture on the bottom right, um, it says test. It's one of the NFTs that I think sold for about you know three hundred thousand US dollars. Um, it could be a video. Um, Nyan Cat, the famous GIF, sold for about six hundred thousand. Um, it's just you know essentially taking whatever digital file that you can think of and minting it. So minting is like in the process of getting a virtual file on the NFT, I mean, on the blockchain, sorry. And virtual lands here, we talk about um, virtual plots of land. I'm sure you've heard of them. Um, they're they're made, made from these um, 
two very famous NFT projects that allows people to sort of buy lands in a digital space where you can build you know, crazy things on top of it. Um, another crazy thing is this, this, this crazy project right here. I'm sure you've seen this guy somewhere you know, on the news. Um, this guy is an Indonesian student that um, takes his selfies um, and has been taking selfies for the past five years and putting them up as an NFT. So he's made about over a million dollars, which is pretty good to say the least. And it's, it's a very simple thing that, that you all can do, right? Putting things um, or putting images or whatever you have on your computer or your laptop and putting it on the blockchain. But of course, creating an NFT collection or a project takes much more than just a simple upload. Now, NFTs can be broken down into sort of different categories of use cases of types, right? We've talked about the formats of NFTs, but going deeper, um, we sort of categorize those into these six um, groups. So on the top left-hand side, you have collectibles. So collectibles are what you can you know, relate to as you know, trading cards in the real world. But collectibles, as NFTs, you basically collect them just for the sake of collecting them because you, you like them. Or most commonly, people collect them, you know, just they want to put it as their profile pictures to show um, other people, you know, I collected like a very famous sort of NFT, NFT project. People do that nowadays because of there's different, different reasons, but I think the main push for high value NFT projects are, you know, social status, even in the digital world, because we spend most of our time there and collectibles are just a way to show that, you know, you're in the club. Metaverse, um, a very famous word. Um, it's basically a virtual world, right? So what, what does it have to do with NFTs? So like I mentioned earlier, the, the virtual lands and stuff, so the virtual lands are essentially NFTs in the metaverse. Um, these two very famous metaverses are the sandbox and the central land. So they basically build a whole world in which you own virtual land as NFTs. And you, know, you can trade the lands, you can do anything with it. Um, just, just that, you know, um, the NFTs are, uh, are tradable and you can you can you know trade them on marketplaces and and just do anything and everything you can think of with with NFTs in the metaverse. Um, other than that, you know objects um, that are more unique to certain metaverses can also be NFTs. So in in general, I would say don't think of metaverses as NFTs. Think of items in the metaverses as NFTs. Um, gaming. Um, very famous sort of use case because um, what the gaming NFT community sort of talks about is how in the traditional world, you know, you spend most of the time in games buying these items, but in the end, you don't really own these items. Um, game developers own these items. When you turn off the game, you, you, really, you literally don't have anything. You only have, you know, memories of what you bought and the painful memories of spending those money. So what, what NFTs does in sort of the gaming space is um, letting you own these digital items and giving more of a utility, creating a whole economy around um, what gaming in-game items used to be. So for example, X Infinity is sort of a PVP sort of game where um, you buy characters, you buy these small Pokemon-esque characters um, as NFTs and use them to battle with one another. So if you don't like that character, you can sell it off to some other person that may want it and you can buy a new one. And it's all, all you know, got to do with real money, crypto, of course. But in the end, you own whatever that you've bought. Now, with art, um, it's sort of, 
a very um you know uh, it help, helps creators a lot you know nft creators talk about how nfts has changed their world um given them life changing experiences all because um, in in the web 2 sort of space it's hard for creators to sort of monetize their work you know they have to go through an intermediary or an auction house in order for them to make their art visible right and even if they sold it um the transaction cost or the chunk of fees that these houses take is going to leave creators with little to nothing after the, after the sale so digital art um as nfts is sort of the groundbreaking moment where nft sort of clicked in the digital world and um people is one of the the the, the biggest art you know, digital art creators out there with with his every day's collection i'm sure you've seen it the 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 collage of 5000 pieces that sold for about 69 million million dollars so it's crazy to think how you can buy art and buy art for such a hit, such a huge price um sports uh, in the sports industry nfts are kind of used as collectibles in a way but they have added utility because in the sports world you have you know fans you have tickets so it sort of make co combining these two concepts of um, turning tickets into NFTs, turning um, players into NFTs that try to engage with fans in a in a in a new way, I would say. And other use other use cases are sort of domains, right? Or um, how would you further identify yourself in the Web three sort of space? So unstoppable domains here is is a project that allows you to mint your name. Because public addresses or digital digital wallets are sort of made up of you know numbers and letters, which is super hard to read. So what they're trying to do is um, make all these more readable and turn that um, name or domain name into an NFT so that you can own it. So what are the other use cases of NFTs, right? I mean, we've heard of collectibles, gaming, and all that stuff, but in the real world, NFTs can or is making a huge impact. So, for example, in the ongoing war, unfortunately, um, this organization called Ukraine DAO raised about 6.75 million through the auction of an NFT of the U of the Ukraine flag. So what they what they did is um, they took an NFT. They made an NFT of the Ukraine flag, and they, you know, basically auctioned it off to a, a pool of, you know, donors. And they've taken that pool and sent it to the, to the wallet of the, you know, wallet of Ukraine, basically. So, it's crazy to think how NFTs can transcend the borders of digital world and get into, you know, the real world. But there's still a lot of misconceptions of how you know NFTs are only you know valuable in terms of you know buying pictures of monkeys, buying pictures of rocks. Um, that's all people are paying for. But I would see it as a new way of owning things, right? Because that's what it was made for. So in order to give you an example of what it can happen or what it can do to like a real world asset, um, we look to the real estate industry. Um, houses, as you know, um, there's a lot of lengthy manu manual processes um, of like going through documents and going through like paper deeds of houses in these offices. Um, NFTs can be used to turn these houses into like a token. So the, the, the idea behind it is you take all the deeds, all the paperwork of the house and you turn it into an NFT and you put it on the blockchain, essentially meaning that no one can change it. It's 
permanent, it's it's you know on the blockchain and for everyone to see because maybe me in Malaysia, I don't know what the houses are, you know, maybe in Australia. If you want to move there, then I have to actually go there and you know survey houses, look for agents, and those are very tedious processes. So what NFTs can do is provide better liquidity because um, real estates can also be broken down into more chunks so that um, people, more people can own, own one house. And it enables new ownership models because um, you're turning a deed, a physical deed into like a token, right? It also can be deeds to anything like a car or like tickets to sports events, legal documents, signatures, whatever you can think of. Now, how do NFTs work? Right, we've talked about what they're used for, but how, how do they actually work? So the basic idea of um, what NFTs, or how do you create an NFT is by turning a digital file into a record on the blockchain. So I don't want to take too much time to explain these things in detail, but um, I'll just go through some of the concepts that I think is important for you to understand when it comes to uh, minting an NFT. So digital wallets, right? Um, NFTs, as I said, can only have one owner at a time. And the owners of an NFT are tied to digital wallets. Um, token standards are basically what's, dif what's differentiating NFTs from crypto. Like crypto is sort of fungible, NFTs are sort of non-fungible. So token standards, when it comes to NFT, they have different standards um, to govern the use or the design of an NFT from a crypto. Metadata, um, it's a complicated word, but it essentially means that data that describes other data. So NFT has metadata that describes um, essential properties of the NFT. So for example, its name, its feature, um, description, rarity, date of creation, whatever. And it's important because NFTs don't Aren't necessarily, the, aren't necessarily the images that you see on, you know, like monkeys or stones or um, cars, right? They're not the actual NFT. That's just an image of where the NFT links to. Um, I think smart contracts, we can kind of talk about it in the next slide because um, smart contract is sort of what governs the function of an NFT. Blockchain is the underlying feature of what makes an NFT you know, possible. And marketplaces is where, where NFTs, um, where you do commerce with NFTs, sales, royalties, the more commercial side of how you use NFTs. And I spoke of royalties earlier. Um, it only happens because smart contract underlies um, each NFT. And to better explain smart contract, um, if you don't mind, Sumi, if you go to the next slide, um, I sort of link smart contracts to the analogy of a vending machine because smart contracts are basically like programs on the blockchain, right? And so they're sort of self-executing, which means that they don't need someone to watch over it. So, so in the real world, we have contracts that we need lawyers to govern and you know design so that um, they have clauses that says if someone doesn't fulfill their requirements, then the contract is, is void. So smart contracts kind of um, removes the intermediary because they're self-executing. So with certain inputs, then the output is sort of guaranteed. So in the, in the analogy of a virtual vending machine, um, when you put money in, enough money in, and you select a drink, it doesn't matter what happens, a can of drink always comes out. So that's the sort of um, analogy that I would give um, when it comes to NF um, NFT smart contracts. Um, it's programmable because we can code any logic into it, any logic that humans can think of, we can just put it into codes and the, the smart contracts will run it. It's automatic, as I said, um, because it takes no third party to execute, it's just, solely relying on the blockchain. And that's um, cost saving because you don't need to pay an intermediary to ensure that the smart contract executes. 
and it's secured kind of because it runs on the blockchain, but we've sort of seen a lot of um, exploits or smart contracts or bugs that has happened over the few years with smart contracts. And so um, there'll be a lot more work going on into it. So yeah, moving forward, um, I think Sume would like to share a bit more on this. Yeah, thank you, William. Yeah, so before I start, I think we have a question from our audience. So uh, William, do you want to answer that now or you want to answer that in the Q&A session later? Um, I think this question is, I think it's a very good question, but um, maybe you can answer that later. Okay, okay, sure. Thanks for the question, by the way. Okay, so, okay, let's um, proceed with the next slide. So, you know, after knowing like how uh, an NFT works and, you know, basic knowledge about NFT, now I would like to introduce um, to you guys the ecosystem of NFT itself. It's basically a whole new world because it's not, it's not the digital ecosystem that you usually see, um, you know, on the internet, like Facebook and everything, right? So what made up the NFT ecosystem? So first of all, of course, the blockchain. So where the NFT are hosted and minted like Ethereum, Solana, um, Flow. And then the second one will be analytics and portfolio services. So what they do is, let's say you have multiple um, wallets or you are an avid NFT investors, you have over 100 over um, NFT you know, in your wallet. So what you can do is you can actually track your portfolio through these services. And number three, um, the decentralized application, uh, where we call it the app, um, are the games like Decentraland, Exit Infinity, social decentralized social media like Nest3 and Minds. Um, number four is the communication channels. These are more, this looks maybe more familiar to everyone. Um, it's the channel where, you know, the community and the project owners engage and do their marketing events, uh, which is Discord, um, Twitter, and Telegram. So we also have the marketplaces, or we call it aggregators for NFT, uh, which is um, the famous one, OpenSea. And then we also have our homegrown brand like Pentas and also um, Pangolin, if I'm not mistaken. So finally, it's about the storage solutions um, for NFT. So um, basically, it's quite dominated by IPFS and Filebase. These are these decentralized storage um, for NFT. So um, to put it in a centralized ways, just imagine it as a cloud storage you know, that we are using right now. Yeah. So next, um, I would like to just uh, go through a little bit about, you know, how NFT has gone really well in the past 12 months. So if I read about some articles talking about how much consumer interest has dropped since the war started, right? But, you know, if we look at some solid data, uh, we can actually prove that NFT is really happening and has grown tremendously, you know, in the past one year. I mean, like, really a lot since the beginning of 2021, right? You see the sales volume was 285 million. And what really surprised me was uh, in 2020, the annual sales volume was 82.5 million only. So we can see that things started to warm up in 2021 and the NFT sales actually skyrocketed in Q2 2021, recording a 613% of growth in merely nine months. So that was, I believe it's pretty impressive for any investor or business to see numbers like this, right? So what dominate the total NFT sales, right? There are so many formats and so many different types of NFTs. So I think it's um, very, it's within the market expectations that the collectibles actually dominate the NFT sales. You can see the blue, the dark blue color is like dominating the graph. And then um, the second one would be um, gaming which uh, is the gray color 
in a graph. So this is really evident when the top five projects that dominate the, that contribute to the total sales volumes are Axie Infinity, 15%, um, Bart, 8, Yacht Club, CryptoPunks, and Artblocks that made up 23.5%. So I think it's, there's no question to, to us when we say that collectibles and gaming actually dominate the total NFT sales, right? Because like how William said, you know, in gaming, uh, gamers are very used to owning in-game assets like weapon, character, skins, and etc. So it's actually very easy for them to adopt that concept of NFT. And it's even better because they get to buy, sell, trade in a more secure kind of um, way. Yeah. So likewise, um, if we look at the number of NFT users, it has grown about 10 times since um, 2020. Of course, um, if you know, we compare to other market, right? Like let's say e-commerce and everything, it's still a very small group of um, NFT users. You see in 2022, February, the latest data says that we have 3.5 million unique wallets um, that have ever owned an NFT. So that is about 10% of the Malaysia population. So that's not really like um, a lot of people, but these are really early adopters that are really active in NFTs. Yeah. So next, um, who are the ecosystem players that actually you know, dominates the space? So I would like to highlight, you know, um, first of all, Ethereum, the first blockchain that support NFT after Bitcoin and its own colored coin. So many of the D apps, the decentralized apps, such as OpenSea, LooksRare, they used Ethereum when they first started. But however, according to JP Morgan, um, Ethereum, you know, even though they once owns like 25% of the NFT market share, uh, today it comes down to about 80%, I'm still a lot, but yeah, it has seen some, you know, um, some drop between because of it's more expensive compared to new blockchain like Solana Wax Flow. And also because it is much slower because of, of the mechanism that they are using, which I will explain later. So the second ecosystem players that really thrive in this space is um, OpenSea the most popular market space for NFT. So OpenSea actually has about 85% of the market share in 2021 alone. But um, as I say, there are more marketplaces that are coming up. So the landscape is getting more intensified. So for example, yeah, like I said, in Malaysia alone, we have two homegrown marketplaces that are coming up, which is so much cheaper for project owners to get started. So um, next, let's look at what are the immediate drivers that actually shape the NFT markets, like who are driving it behind, right? So number one would be consumer speculation, I would say. Yeah, it's still the speculative hype that is um, forming the NFT market. So I think for this, we can relate back to crypto. So for the past two years, people are rushing into crypto investments, right? Because of, you know, everyone is at home, they, they got nothing to do, so they go for crypto. <laughs> yeah. So, and like what we see on the news, crypto are highly uh, volatile. So these crypto holders, they actually, you know, they call it diversifying the portfolio, but some say it's like leveraging their bet to, to actually to, to, to get more returns or in other way to suffer more loss by moving their portfolio to NFT from crypto to NFT, right? So that's the consumer speculation that forms the NFT market growth. So number two would be the enterprise adoption. So we see a lot of big brands like Coca-Cola, Adidas, and, and even McLaren, they have launched their own NFT projects uh, to, to their consumers. So besides, we also see partnership between traditional payment gateway like MasterCard and crypto exchange platform Coinbase. 
you know, to, to create an easier and seamless way for their consumers to purchase NFT. So in another way, previously, if you want to, you know, purchase an NFT, you might need to explore your own. But now, um, since MasterCard is doing this collab with Coinbase, so you can actually buy using your MasterCard, MasterCard debit or credit card. So that essentially um, bring the convenience to the, co the consumer. So number three, it's the institutional investment. So traditional VCs like SoftBank, Sequoia, and some crypto-focused VCs are really pouring a lot of cash. I mean, a lot. If you can, you know, read our um, report, you'll see the, the growth of it is about 16 or 17,000 percent in terms of the investment into NFT related startups. So these are really strong catalysts for the ecosystem to grow because you can't grow without investor pouring capital for startups to innovate, to grow, right? So yeah, so we will foresee that, you know, in the short term, we'll see more investment coming into the space and you know, startups will start to compete and eventually become more efficient and innovative you know, in, in building this NFT space. So um, finally, we see technology improvement in terms of NFT, you know, improvement in smart contract developments, layer two scaling improvement to, be, you know, to make the space less congested, and also um, metaverses. So metaverse is actually a synergy de development of for NFT. Yeah, because when there are more metaverses than, you know, like HSBC, they are building their own metaverses, then essentially if they want to do some services or, you know, digital products in their metaverse, they are likely to do it in an NFT way, you know, creating a token and sell it to the consumers. Okay. So next. So well, but what are the barriers stopping NFT from mass adoption, right? So yeah, I mean, we see the positive sides of NFT. So what are the challenges that they are facing now? So number one, lack of education, um, lack of understanding of blockchain technology. And also, you know, people don't understand, you know, a lot of people don't even understand blockchain nowadays. So especially those, um, I would say, senior people in, you know, large enterprises. And they, you know, there are also, you know, lack of informal, um, formal, sorry, lack of formal and reliable sources you know, to, 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 for them to actually understand about blockchain and how NFT works because what we got was, you know, basically all online. You don't usually see people reading a book for NFT, right? I mean, there are, but not many. And you don't know whether, you know, the sources are reliable or not. So that's why we are here anyways. That's so, <laughs> so number two is the shortage of um, blockchain talent. Um, we still see a very, you know, um, shortage of um, blockchain developers and NFT talents in the industry. You know, um, there are, I mean, you see, you know, startups always, NFT startups are hiring people from the digital companies like Facebook, YouTube. They tend to get people from there, you know, bring them in and then, skill up them to actually be able to work in the blockchain industry. So the lack of blockchain talent essentially is the one of the biggest challenge for the space to grow. Number three, the consumer backlash. I think this is um, so far the most um, things that we see online nowadays, you know, in all the social media. So some of them call NFT a crypto scam, you know, some of the, you know, one of the actor, um, Kainu Reeves, uh, he even said in a public event that, you know, NFT is a joke to him. So in case you don't know who he is, he plays as uh, Thomas Anderson in the movie, The Matrix. It's an old movie anyways. Yeah. Also John Wick. Yeah. So a lot of people, they do not believe it's in NFT because, you know, it goes back to, they do not understand what it is. 
That's why hence the backlash happened. So number four, underdeveloped use cases. So a lot of NFT use cases are still, you know, at a very early stage, I would say, you know, across industry. Even a lot of enterprise, they have been launching their own NFT projects, right? But there are no, you know, standard success, success metrics that, you know, tell them that, oh, you know, your, your NFT actually works, you know, it creates a spillover effect, you know, for your sales or, you know, in terms of your revenue for your business line. So these are the challenges from mass adoption. Yep. So other than challenges, there are also a lot of risks, you know, that are associated with the NFT adoption. So when I may say risk, it's about, um, let's say, you know, when, you, when an enterprise, they are trying to adopt NFT, you know, these are the concerns that they will look at because they are not sure of, you know, how to handle it. Number one, um, the unclear regulations, anti-money laundering, um, terrorism, financial concerns, unclear guidance around financial reporting. So, you know, let's say if a company, they want to launch an NFT project, you know, they launch it essentially, um, how are they going to report um, in their annual reports, let's say, you know, especially for the listed public companies, you know, there are no reported standards that are dedicated for NFT projects yet. And also, you know, taxation policies, some countries, they do mention, you know, in black and white that any trades of NFT, uh, it is charged on your income tax. Some of them charge on the capital gains. So, but this is not really that clear yet. And also the consumer protection responsibility, you know, let's say if a consumer face a, you know, they, they fall into a scam, so, and lose some of their crypto, so who are they going to report to, you know? So, Number two, um, lack of IP enforcement. So while the technology of blockchain and tokens is rapidly evolving, the underlying intellectual property rights associated with NFT can be quite analogized to existing IP legal frameworks. So for example, this is uh, one of the examples I got on the internet. Um, one of the US copyright acts provides copyright owners with exclusive rights to reproduce, display, um, copy, and prepare um, derivative works and distribute copies of the underlying works. So, you know, when we look at NFT, NFT has two components, the ownership of the token itself and the ownership of the IP rights to the underlying content linked to the NFTs. So, for the NFT that may contain unauthorized elements in the underlying media, the analysis of fair use will be applicable, including transformative nature of the work and other established fair use factors. So another challenge would be how the traditional IP bundle of rights is defined in relation to NFTs and who has the rights to you know, create or what you say, mint the NFT containing such IP. You know, let's say um, when a IP holder has a large IP portfolio and, you know, they work with multiple authors. So how are they going to decide who had the right to mean it? Right. Um, number three, um, of course, is about the malicious behaviors that is um, happening every day in the NF NFT space. Um, there are a lot of insider and watch trainings of NFTs happening. There are scams sprout, shield bidding by malicious actors. You know, it's, I mean, for any financial related transactions, they're always scam. So, you know, likewise, it happens in NFT as well. So number four um, is the immature technology. 
So even though I just mentioned that there were improvement in terms of the technology, right? But I would say it's, it is still at the very early stage. So there are um, some vulnerabilities that is happening in the NFT, such as unsecure off-chain storage of NFTs, you know, malicious um, usage of bots, and also some you know, um, shortcomings in terms of the smart contract security. So next, um, I think this is um, so far the biggest arguments about NFT, the climate controversy, right? A lot of people say that NFT is a threat to the environment because it consumes so much of the energy. So in the earlier slide, slides, right, it shows that 80% of NFTs are minted on Ethereum blockchain. So on Ethereum, the NFTs are using the proof of work operating method, which uses large amount of electricity. So it can actually, you know, um, accelerate um, climate change by adding the atmosphere carbon dioxide emissions, you know, and yada yada. In short, become harmful to the environment. So I got this data to help you to illustrate better how much energy would an NFT consume on an average. So basically you can see, you know, to mean an addition of uh, an single addition NFT uh, is equivalent to flying on a flight for two hours, driving 100,000 km in, in petrol, using a computer for 10 months, using a laptop for three years. That's crazy, right? So now you may ask like, uh, well, what the hell is um, proof of work and why does this require extensive of energy consumption, right? So, well, proof of work is one of the consensus mechanism that um, crypto use to add new transactions to the blockchain and create new tokens. So it was pioneered by Bitcoin and used by the Ethereum layer one right now. So proof of work blockchains are secure and verified by virtual miners around the world and they will be raising to be the first to solve a max puzzle. So the first one to solve the max puzzle gets to update the blockchain with the latest verified transaction and is rewarded by the network with a predetermined amount of crypto. So hence, in order to you know, become the winner, people compete, right? So to compete, they tend to use like expensive mining devices with um, you know, outstanding computational power to compete. Hence, it requires high energy consumption and also, you know, it brings a, you know, it, it causes um, this proof of work um, blockchain to be more expensive to mean and relatively slower because it is, it is so congested inside. Yeah. I think before we move mm -hmm. on to some of the solutions, mm -hmm. Like so, so the sustainability of NFTs, like the issue behind it, is it isn't really, you know, boiled, solely boiled to NFTs because NFTs are built on the blockchain, right? So when the blockchain runs, then it uses electricity. So regardless of how NFTs get created, then the energy usage is still quite high. So, and another example is you know, compare this whole blockchain system to the original or the current financial system, right? The energy usage is, is as crazy or, you know, 10 times crazier. Yeah. Right. But probably because, you know, there are not many adoption of NFT yet. That's also true. It might <laughs> contribute to more transactions. But, but we have solutions currently to deal with this, right? Yeah, we always have a solution for problems. So what are the solutions looks like today? Um, number one, um, alternative proof of stake based layer one blockchains. That means new blockchains uh, um, like Tezo and Flow. Number two, um, the existing Ethereum will shift to a proof of stake system and reduce 99% of its environmental impact and energy use. So now uh, you might be wondering what is proof of stake again, right? 
like okay you we mentioned about proof of work so what is proof of stake so it's essentially another consensus mechanism used to record new transactions as well so how is it different from proof of work of course um it will consume less energy it is more scalable and you know it charge a lower fees that's why you know this is the solution to you know to ethereum right so let me quickly go through how does proof of stake work so in proof of stake validators are chosen or miners are chosen based on the number of tokens they hold rather than miners competing with each other to be the one who add the new block to make it easier for you know for you all to understand let's say go is ethereum tokens so whoever who owns you know a one kg of gold will have thousand times more voting rights compared to someone who owns one gram of gold so when a validator is chosen they will need to create a block if they are not chosen then they will need to validate the block so similarly you know validators that got chosen they will get a predetermined reward for their work as well so i hope that is clear for proof of stake so number three um, the solution is to have a layer two solution that will bundle and process transaction off chain to reduce energy usage through economies of scale so what is layer two solution again it might be confusing my god there are so many solutions here so okay so a layer two chain is linked to ethereum on each side of the main chain's length axis um, it uses ethereum connected blockchain to handle transaction um, so essentially these small transactions right they are combined into the bigger ones or we call it roll up blocks and the roll up blocks it will go through you know they it will be sent to ethereum you know, in a form of one transaction, a single transaction, instead of a series of smaller ones for the rollout block. So to make it more, you know, easy to understand, I have another analogy to help you. So imagine Ethereum layer one as a city, you know, as, you know, KL, let's say, you know, the city center of KL, like Bukit Bintang and, you know, Mon Kiara, expensive places, right? So if you want to own a piece of land there and build a house for yourself, it's going to be super expensive, right? So how do we scale KL City or Mount Kiara to accommodate more people? We will build skyscrapers. We build like 50 stories condo, like the one in Chira, as you know, 50 stories. So that essentially make it less expensive or more affordable for people to stay in that area. Okay, so that is essentially the layer two. But because the high rise is still built on an expensive land, which is um, KL City Center. So if I want to move around, I still have to descend to the ground. And that is the layer one of Ethereum and deal with the underlying traffic, expensive groceries and you know congested traffic. So, you know, that is one of the solutions, you know, to build high rise, but it is still for the more afforded, you know, um, rich people which can afford to stay there. So we have like new townships, like, you know, let's say Kajang or Kota Damansara. Then that is, you know, where alternative layer one blockchains come in, like Pezzo, Flow, Solana, you know. So just imagine it is a, city so it will be more easier to understand like what is layer one what are the layer one blockchains and new layer one blockchains so um, number four solution is um, we have new smart contract standards that aims to make blockchain transactions more energy efficient yeah so finally i think uh, we have come to the end of uh, today's session um we we foresee top four trends you know that will happen in the nft space this year number one security will be the priority 
for every ecosystem player. Uh, we foresee that they will take it really serious to make NFT trading more secure because this essentially will give confidence to get, you know, for new users to enter the space. Also, it will encourage more enterprise use case, which is a strong driver for NFT to go big. Uh, number two, the enterprise adoption of NFTs. Uh, we, we think that, you know, we, with the synergy de development of metaverses, um, definitely, you know, enterprise adoption will be more solidified in next in this year. Uh, number three, um, new Ethereum will launch um, that will improve the scalability, the security, and the sustainability. Number four, we also think that global regulations will catch up eventually. Uh, it will become clearer, especially in terms of consumer protection guidelines, um, anti money laundering, and etc. So, yeah, to wrap up today's session, uh, just want to give a little bit of context about Web3. So, to begin with, uh, we start from Web1. So, an example for Web1 will be Netscape, where internet is basically a read-only interface. It is a static and distributed model. Then we move to Web2. That is what we are using right now. It is a read and write interface, but however, it is under a centralized entity like Facebook, YouTube, Google, or any tech giants. So one day, just imagine if YouTube shut down its server, you won't be able to access any video anymore. You know, even the videos that you upload from your, for yourself. Or let's say if one day Facebook shut down its server, you won't be able to trace back your chat between you and your friends, right? So, but in Web3, it's a different case. It is a read, write, execute, and own. The holy grail here is the decentralization. Under Web3 ecosystem, the core technologies are blockchain, smart contracts, and decentralized storage. So it's, you heard a lot about decentralization. And how consumer live with Web3 is via crypto, NFT, metaverse, decentralized finance, um, DAO, decentralized autonomous organization. So, you know, if we look at the, if we zoom out to the big picture, NFT is essentially an element for Web3 to come into reality. Of course, there are so much to talk about Web3. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things to talk about Web3. It's not only limited to this slide. Uh, we hope that we can have another session for that. And yeah, that's all about our presentation today. William, do you have anything to add on? No, I think you summed, off, summed it off really well. Um, uh, apologies for yeah. taking a bit longer of your Wednesday evening. Um, yeah. If you have any questions, raise your hand or feel free to type it in the chat because we'd love to hear some from you guys. Um, regarding the earlier question, um, I have one from Kishon that says, how do you value the price of an NFT? I think it's a really good question, really important question. Um, generally, I would say how you value an NFT or what's the price someone would pay for an NFT is what others would pay for it because there is no intrinsic value that can you know, put a number to the price of an NFT. But of course, value is different to everyone. Um, art collectors would want to buy art because it's limited, it's scarce, it's rare. They might pay you know, millions of dollars for it. I mean, I'm not an art collector, so if I see an art, I wouldn't pay, I wouldn't even pay $100 for it. So. I guess value is kind of um, subjective to each person, but it's actually a very good lead up to what we're going to have um, next week. Our next session is going to be an expert discussion on understanding the, the values of NFTs. So if you move on to the next slide, excuse me, we're going to have, uh, we'll show a poster yeah, of our next event that will have um, Two, two to three experts that will talk about 
um, some of the values that um, NFTs have and what's creating all this, all this value. Yeah, uh, we have another question from Andrew. Um, how do you evaluate the authenticity of an NFT project? A bit, uh, a bit out of, out of scope, but of course, uh, we'll be happy to answer that. Uh, authenticity, I, I, I think you mean, um, how do you ensure that rub, the NFT doesn't get, you know, rock pulled or, or you know, investors getting scammed? I think it's very subjective because you have to think of all NFT projects like a startup and its founders as you know, the startup, the people that work on the startup. Um, in order to prevent yourself from falling into like a startup sort of trap, maybe look at the founders first and see whether they have potential or they have prior track records of creating good stuff. I think personally, um, I'm invested in a NFT project that has an artist that has worked on previous projects before and their work are quite good. So you may or may not expect the same thing happening when it comes to NFT spaces. I mean, I'm not a you know, NFT investment guru or anything. I don't want to give any financial advice, but I guess all you could do is do your own research, I guess. And follow like the simple rules of, you know, if you see any warning flags like um, high mint prices or, um, or just projects trying to take advantage of, you know, um, FOMO that are trying to, you know, just get as many people in as quickly as possible and then just run away with the money. I mean, it's quite it's quite hard to evaluate, but um, that's why NFT is such a volatile space and such a risky space that you should invest with money that you're willing to willing to lose. Yeah, any other questions, guys? Any other questions on you know yeah. what NFTs are? How do you better understand NFTs? Oh, anyone want to speak up anything about? No, just raise your hand and we'll allow you to talk. I know it's a bit over the, the time, but we'll make sure to stick to the to stick to the schedule on the next one. Yeah. No questions. Okay, I think, I think uh, I'll just like, you know, say something, you know, if there's any question, then you guys can just drop at the Q&A. But um, so for this immersion program, right? I'm oh, sorry, there's some noise coming from my neighbor. So um, this program is essentially a three event kind of thing like today you have an induction with us the analyst then the next one will be a round table session with our expert from the nft you know our crypto industry then we'll have a peer study plus networking session for you know all of us to know each other and today is the first session and this is the first time that you know we conduct this event so i hope um you like it or you know if you have any feedback feel free to um you know set you know tell us through email or the discord channel that you know if you guys have joined and i really hope that you know all of us can go through the next two session so we can you know all learn something and get something out of it in the future yep yeah i think that's there shouldn't be any question moving forward. And I think um, I just want to say one last thing. So the emergence is sort of um, a way for you to get a grip of the whole topic. We, we kind of designed it as three events because we want to um, give you an overall picture of maybe what NFT fundamentals are. And then the next immersion could be um, what are the NFT enterprise use cases. Then we're going to have three events dedicated to help you learn about that one topic. So if you 
are interested or if you you know you enjoy it, if you're gonna enjoy um the next two sessions, then feel free to share this and hopefully we'll see you in the next one. Yep. Oh, any site or newsletter you could recommend us to study NFT? Yeah, I think if you have, I'm not sure, um, Andrew, do you have our report? If you do, then we have a notion space that we recommend, you know, we have some links that we'll recommend you to read from some websites. Yeah. Um, I think other than that, if you want like more mainstream stuff, you can always um, visit at least few sites that I go to. Um, Coindesk, Blockworks. Um, I think Blockworks is a really good um, newsletter that you can follow that gives you daily recaps of uh, news. But of course, the main one is always Twitter NFT because that's where uh, the Twitter people are and that's where you um, get the get the most information in the shortest time possible because you know all the DJs are there and yeah, um, but it's a very messy space so you have to be careful with who you follow. Yeah. So yeah, um, if there's no questions, then I thank you all for taking your time out for today and joining us on our first session of NFT fundamentals. Okay. Thank you. Thank guys. you, everyone. Okay. See you. Bye bye.